My name is Ashton, and I'm the president of the ch 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 charity Direct MS, and we try and put on a presentation once a once a he once every he every year or so. And this is the year we decided this is going to be our vitamin D D year because there's been so much research done over the past five or six years that we thought we've got to bring this to the people. And I'm so glad you all came out here to, to uh, find out about all, this, about all this brand new research and what it means to you and, and what you wanted to do afterwards. So just to start the evening, uh, this is also being sponsored by the, 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 the Vitamin D Society, of, of which I'm a, a director. But we have, the, we, have the, we have the executive director of the Vitamin D Society has come into town. And his and name is Perry Holman. And I would like to bring Perry up. And, and Perry will introduce our first speaker, who is our warm-up act. Carol, and then, our, then I'll be followed by our main speaker, Robertini. So, Perry, would you please introduce Carol, who might not need much anymore. <laughs> Hi, I'd like to thank everybody for coming tonight. Uh, really uh, appreciate the support, and, and uh, we'd really like to give you the information and let you carry it to your families and your loved ones and tell them how important vitamin D is. Um, Carol is, uh, her company or company or organization in the U.S. is called Grassroots Health. Um, you can find it at grassrootshealth.net and uh, she's done uh, a heck of a lot for the vitamin D, uh, getting the word out on vitamin D um, and her group has uh, put together a lot of documents that you can find on our website. So please go there and without further ado, I'll let Carol come back up and tell you all about vitamin D. First of all, you have to find the on button, right? I never let anybody introduce me with anything other than here's Carol Baggerly. Do you know why? You don't know why? Not even a test question, you don't know why? Well, see, way upon a long time ago, a long, long, long time ago, I was in sales, and I know you never would have guessed that. <laughs> but one of the things they taught us was don't ever, ever let anybody introduce you because your audience isn't going to believe what they say anyway. So you might as well just stand up and start doing your stuff, and then your audience can get whatever they need from your information. So thank you again for coming tonight. I have some stories to tell you. This is vitamin D and disease prevention, um, an exercise. And my biggest message to you tonight is going to be creating action now. We have seen all the studies we need to see. And forever after, there will always need to be more research. But today is the day we need to get on with it. I want to tell you a short personal story about getting on with it. In 2005, I had the pleasure of being retired. I really was, believe it or not. I actually retired in 2001. So I've been retired for four whole years. Don't ask me what I was doing, but that's another question. In 2005, I was diagnosed with breast cancer. It was a very large tumor. It literally was two and a half inches in diameter. That is a very big tumor, right? I had a mastectomy, I had chemo, and I had radiation. And when I was done with it, even before I was done with it, folks, okay? When I was done with it, I was appalled. Not at the cancer, believe it or not, but at the treatment. It is barbaric. It destroys the body, 
takes parts of your body away and leaves you with lifelong debilitation of various organs and things as a result of the treatment. In 2005, after this treatment, it became my mission in life to do something about it. Now, I do have a scientific background, not in biochemistry, but in physics and mathematics. I have family in the medical industry. I even have a very well-known son at MD Anderson Cancer Institute who's a biostatistician. And one time I called him and I said, Keith, what on earth is this all about? And you know what he said? He said, Mom, it's the best we can do. And because I'm his mom, I said, it ain't good enough. And I read, and I read, and I read, and I went to seminars, and I did nothing day in, day out, but read about cancer, read about treatment, read about breast cancer, talk with doctors, you name it, I did it. And then in 2007, February the 10th, I went to the doctor, and I was told that I had osteoporosis. And I said, how can I? I work out every day. I do all these good body lifting things. I'm not overweight most of the time. I eat well. How could I have osteoporosis? And my doctor said, Carol, you might be deficient in vitamin D. I said, what's that? Well, she sort of told me. But anyway, I went home, went back to my challenge with the, the cancer, all right? And I apologize to this day to absolutely every scientist I now know in the vitamin D community. And it took me two solid hours, two hours, before I keyed in the words vitamin D and cancer. And what happened next to this day when I tell audiences about it, I get goosebumpy and I remember the scene. This slide is what I saw. Right there you see on those screens, the idea on the bottom line is a serum 25 hydroxy vitamin D level. I keep talking about vitamin D levels. Those numbers across the bottom are that. And up at the top, all you need to pay attention to is the fact that the line goes down. The more, the higher the vitamin D level, the less the risk of breast cancer. Right there on that slide, it says that you have a 50% lower risk of breast cancer if your serum level is 125 nanomoles per liter than if it happens to be at 25. I looked at that, and I just looked. The next thing I knew, the tears started coming down my face. I started shaking. I shake a lot. I started shaking. And my mind says, this can't be true. I'm very critical of science, all right? I said, this can't be true. I don't believe it. I did a little more research, but not much, before I picked up the phone and called a professor I know at UCSD, UC San Diego. I know a lot there. And I said, do you know this guy? Do you know Cedric Garland? Is he a flake? And I was told, oh, Carol, he's not only not a flake. He is very discouraged. I said, he's been discouraged? Why? And she said, he has been doing this research for 30 years. 30 years. And nobody's listening. I said, I'm listening. I then went up to see Dr. Tony Norman at uh, UC Riverside. He's one of the granddaddies, he's actually older than Dr. Garland, uh, of vitamin D to talk with him. And I'll never forget that meeting either. I walked into his house, he invited me to his house, and after a short period of time, he says, Carol, would you like to sit down? I had a lot of questions. At any rate, in 2007, in May, there was a conference, a National Cancer Institute conference on vitamin D and cancer. I wanted to go. And Dr. Norman, uh, in my meeting with him, I told him I'd try to apply to go, but the NCI told me, no, you can't come. You're not a medical person. You're not part of the team. You're not doing a presentation. We don't have room for you. And Tony, Dr. Norman says, oh, 
Well, you can go with me. I'm running it. <laughs> now, do I find the right people to start with or not? Okay. I went to the conference. And here's the kicker. I spent two days listening to all of these beautiful scientists from all over the world talk about vitamin D and cancer. Everything wasn't positive. There wasn't anything negative. There was a lot of blah, all right? But it was about everything from mice experiments that they'd done to some human experiments, <laughs> whatever. And I am just awed with all that they knew. And at the end of those two days, Dr. John Milner, who was then the chair or the head of the nutrition branch of NCI asked to his subset of that, that group of people, where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? And I am so excited. I am ready to conquer the world. I'm ready to save the world, all right? And to a person, guess what they said? What? Well, close, what? It starts with an R. Research! And I'm sitting there going, huh? And to this day, I swear, <clears throat> I swear that my microphone, everybody had a microphone, this was a very fancy site. My microphone had a little red dot on the end of it. Everybody's did, all right? But mine pulsed. <laughs> it pulsed. And I pressed the button. And I stood up. And I said one very short sentence. I said, where is your sense of urgency? And I sat down. That's all I had to say. The end of the seminar was essentially right then. Uh, I timed it very well, don't you think? Um, and, but what happened next was the most beautiful of all. People got up. These were researchers and doctors. Fully half the room, half the room, stood in a line to talk to me, to ask me, how can we help you? They care. We then, my husband and I, took off on a six-month motorhome trip to go meet with them in their offices to say, what's the message? You can't ever sell anything unless you know what the message is, all right? And we will talk about that. Thanks for listening to my personal story. This is another picture. And again, all you really need to pay attention to is it goes down. The higher the vitamin D level, the greater the reduction in incidence of breast cancer. And it is so great, this reduction in incidence is so great that Dr. Garland actually believes that breast cancer is a vitamin D deficiency disease, just as scurvy is a vitamin C deficiency disease. Try that one on. Here's another one, similar lines. Please note that those studies that are reported there are almost all on that same line. It's not just one above, one below, and I drew a line between them, all right? There is a very clear pattern of the higher the serum level, up to a point, of course, the less the risk of breast cancer. Then, Dr. Haney, who you will hear later tonight, in 2007, <clears throat> along with one of his coworkers, published a study showing that with vitamin D and cancer, the higher levels of all cancers, not one by one, but all of them lumped together, there was a 77% reduction in all cancers. And this was a randomized trial. And this one I only want to highlight at the bottom how big that difference was. The placebo group, 6.8% had cancer. In the calcium and D group, only 2%. All right, he will talk a little bit more about this when he talks. But folks, it doesn't take much to start looking at all this data and say, we've got to move. We've got to move. This is another one that I think is extremely significant. This is a study done by Pamela Goodwin right here in Canada at Mount Sinai. And she said the higher the serum level you have at the beginning of your breast cancer treatment, all right, you've got it already. Those that had a higher serum level above 75 nanomoles per liter had a 50% lower probability of getting a recurrence. How many of you in the room have had breast cancer or know somebody who has had it? Almost the whole room. Isn't that pathetic? That is sad. With technology and cancer, in the US in 2010, $16 billion was spent. <clears throat> the benefits are 
marginal, and I will show you why. Since 1960, life expectancy has increased 6.97 years. We must be doing something right, folks. The increase from cardiovascular has been about almost five years, almost all hypertensive-related things. The increase from cancer change, 0.19 years. Do your quick math on that one. 10 weeks. 10 weeks? I was so mad when I saw that. Do you know why I was mad? Sure you do. Because I had cancer treatment, which has left me with some debilitating conditions that I will live with the rest of my life. For what? All right? I truly do not believe personally, and you have to make your own decisions, but I do not personally believe that my cancer treatment helped me. I believe it was quickly finding out about vitamin D. And I also believe very strongly that it was stopping taking the hormone replacement therapy that I was taking and got off of doses. All right? So, but whether it's me or not, 10 weeks? We got to do better than that. Here's the answer. Get your serum level to 100 to 115 nanomoles per liter. Take calcium. Get the word out. Become an activist. If you walk out of here tonight with that message alone, Put it on your shoulder blades, put it on your mouth, put it on your everything, and do something about it. We can solve this problem in a year. It doesn't take forever. The other message I want to give you tonight is start sooner. You're all too old. I'm sorry. You're all too old. On the other hand, on the other hand, I have childbearing family. We need to start sooner. Let me tell you why, and let me tell you how. Grassroots Health has initiated a Protect Our Children Now campaign, and that means starting in the womb. It actually means starting preconception, because so many childhood diseases and lifelong chronic diseases are now being traced back to conditions literally in the womb. Why wait? I want to show you this chart. Some of you have already seen it, that kind of bold orange thing, 100 to 150 nanomoles per liter. That part there is where you need to get your serum level. Right now, just take a look at left and right. Left side, you see one item on the bottom. It's called rickets. And you can very clearly see, if you trace that one to the top, uh, that the serum level needed to prevent rickets is 50 nanomoles per liter. But then please look at all those things on the right. Falls take 75 nanomoles per liter, all right? That all cancer I told you needed about 95 nanomoles per liter. Type 1 diabetes needs 130. Every disease that you choose has something distinct that it needs. There is no one size fits all other than what we know so far all right, and the so far is one of those conditional statements. What we know so far is they fit within that window of 100 and 150. Furthermore, it's safe to be there. This I want to show you specifically for pregnancy conditions because it is absolutely critical that you see how size the problem is. Again, we've got the same 100 to 115 nanomoles per liter there. And the very first pregnancy condition we have is preeclampsia, preterm births, infections of pregnancy, any comorbidities, and I'll talk about the hormone desaturation in a minute. All of these, all of these, preeclampsia, preterm birth, less than 37 weeks. Does anybody know what that causes, by the way? All kinds of lifelong problems, and I'll tell you more about that. But anyway, by getting the serum level up to, and in this case, they got their serum level up to about 48, nanomol, excuse me, 48 nanograms per milliliter, which is about 120 nanomoles per liter. I, I talk in nanograms per milliliter. I'm doing pretty good, though. 80% uh, of that could be prevented uh, by getting your serum level there. Fully 47% of preterm births. Do you know the March of Dimes has been trying and publishing stuff on, pre, excuse me, on uh, preterm births for a decade? And nowhere on their website is there a mention of? 
Would somebody please tackle the March of Dimes? I mean, really, no. Uh, I will. I'm sure you will, too. Infections. Infections in pregnancy are rife. I hadn't really realized this, but women who are pregnant have lots of various and sundry kinds of infections. We just met with a researcher at uh, Caltech who wrote a beautiful book for the, any of you that are interested. It was called Infectious Diseases and Behaviors. And what he was talking about were the infectious diseases primarily of the womb and or of that prenatal period and their relationship to schizophrenia, to autism, to multiple sclerosis, and all kinds of other things that don't necessarily show up in that nine months, nor do they necessarily show up in that first year of life. The other thing that, to me, is the end all and be all, in our bodies, the vitamin D that we take, D3 converts into 25 OHD, there's no test on this, 25 OHD, which then gets converted into the hormone part, which is the active part, and the creation of that active part plateaued or maximized only when the woman's vitamin D level got to right at 100 nanomoles per liter. Folks, for God's sake, if you have a pregnant child, a pregnant woman, I mean a family member, anybody, get them to get their vitamin D tested and please have them take vitamin D. I mean, there's nothing, nothing more significant for their health. The other things down there at the bottom, the childhood conditions, I put the flu, language impairment, the ability to talk, neurocognitive deficits, infant uh, respiratory infections, which you know are profound, all of those, 79, 80, 50%, just think of what an impact on society that would have. This last one here I think is also in Dr. Haney's slides, but I want to tell you about it now, it blew my mind. It's called later preeclampsia. Got that? What that means is, I couldn't think of the right words for it. What that means is, if I have been a child born in a preeclampsia mother, all right, my risk as a girl child, I gather, as a girl child, when I get to be childbearing, is I have a 50% higher risk of, pre, of developing preeclampsia in my own pregnancy. Can you believe that? It's there. The other thing I found amazing also is in breast cancer, back again to that one. You can take a girl of nine years of age, write down her serum level, and you can say, oh, you have a 50% chance of getting breast cancer when you're 55. That's how serious it is. And rickets I put on there just for fun and games, okay? That's still our baseline for what we should be doing, and it's way, 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 way too low. I want to show you this very quickly just to kind of see where does that 100 to 150 come from. Uh, over on the far left, you see that old royal primates there. Don't you love the picture, by the way? Don't you love that? We used to be, they used to be out in the sun all the time doing all their great stuff. And now we've got these scrunched over people sitting in computers doing their stuff. Um, the winter 43 degrees north latitude happens to be Toronto. What is your latitude? 50, 50-ish, okay, uh, is low. It's about 40 to 50 on average here. This happens to be Reinhold Zwieth's lab, for shame. He's a vitamin D researcher, in case you don't know. He gave them 1,000 IU a day, they went up a little bit. He gave them 4,000 IU a day, and they went up a little bit more, but still not enough, right? The answer is still the same, no matter what your age. Get your serum level to 150 to 100, excuse me, 100, 150 nanomoles per liter. And says who? Says 42 prominent vitamin D researchers whom I have met. Each and every one of them say this, and they say it's important. And they wish, to goodness sakes, that everyone would listen. The status of the evidence is profound. Toxicity, I had several people ask me, oh, taking more than 1,000 IU a day, I'll show you why you need to do that, but there's been no toxicity in formal reports reported at less than 30,000 IU a day taken for months at a time, all right? It's not gonna happen. Furthermore, you look at that bottom line there, there's no toxicity below 
500 nanomoles per liter. The other message that I will show you is it's hard to get there. That is from our study from our group, this one right here, our project, serum level versus intake. If you take a look at 4,000 international units, about the third, one, two, third line there, everyone on that blue dot up and down is taking 4,000 IU a day. And if you look at the serum levels over on the right side there, you see that there are some people where that black line is, is at 100. That's the minimum they ought to be. I've got a few people below 100 that are taking 4,000 IU a day. I've got a whole bunch above, and I actually have somebody at about 300 nanomoles per liter, and they're taking 4,000 IU a day. Now, that particular spread is characteristic no matter what intake you've got. So please tell me how you can decide what the intake ought to be when you don't know what the serum level is. You don't know. You do not know, all right? The next really important, couple of important things here. The next really important thing is that solid black line that I just drew there. If vitamin D intake stayed constant, the more I take, like if I take 4,000 IU a day, it's gonna do me twice as much, rise in my serum level is 1,000, so forth and so on. If it acted that way, that red line would go up like that black line but it doesn't. As a matter of fact, it flattens out. And what that means is if I take 1,000 IU a day, I might rise my serum or increase my serum level by 10, uh, four nanomoles per liter, all right? But if I take 10,000, it's not gonna multiply it by 10. It slows down in its effect once you get to higher levels. This is why it is very hard to get toxic with vitamin D. We are not recommending that you take really high levels, but you can see there are people there that are taking as much as 10,000 IU a day, and not one of them has had any toxicity problems. This is just a handy little chart. I saw that Pure North passed out a version of this earlier. Depending upon where you are on the left, you can kind of take a quick look from that research project and see what you need to try to see, does this work for you? And then another word the experts say. Do you ever get tired of hearing people say things? Do you ever just grit your teeth and say, I wish I had an answer to that? And then the next question you always have to ask yourself is, now that I've got the answer, how do I say it politely? Sure. Okay, this is what the experts say about vitamin D. The recommendations that you keep seeing about vitamin D and intake, oh, you should take 600 IU a day, you should take 2,000 IU a day. I'm not going to address it all because I don't believe in it. On the other hand, if you go look for what's common, what did they all say? Well, down at the bottom it says, that little red thing says N-O-A-E-L, and that means no observed adverse effect level, meaning if you take that much, we can't find anything that goes wrong, all right? UL is an upper level. It's truly a throw in the dart, maybe not quite, but almost as to what we should tell you the upper level is based on the NOEL. The IOM says 10,000 IU a day is a NOEL. The Endocrine Society says 10,000 IU a day is a NOEL. The European Food Standards Association says 10,000 IU a day is a NOEL. And grassroots health, hey, we'll go along. And sunshine, eh, they're pretty unlimited, but their sunshine is between 10 and 20. If you stick in your medical practice with the idea that what is the no observed effect level and say, hey, that is the guideline we're going by, you're cool, it works, everybody agrees. For ages zero to eight, there are slightly different reference ranges, and they got about 4,000 there. Uh, note the note there that in Lancet, 2,000 IU a day in infancy was given, and 31 years later, nobody had any bad effects, and Dr. Haney will talk some more about that. I'm going to skip through the rest of this very quickly. Um, all of these things show the number of pregnancy things that could be prevented. This is this. Cost to society of preterm births. 
you ever run out of time? I've run out of time. Sorry about that. Um, I need to page down, page down, page down, bump. Protect our children now. What do we need to do? We need to educate, educate, educate the public, the doctors, everybody. We need to test. I'm sorry, you have to test. If you don't test your vitamin D level, you don't know where the squat you are. You need to track it. We are not at a point where we can't write it down and track what the health outcomes are. We've got to do that. We've got to report it. We've got to get everybody involved in learning what's going on. And we obviously have to promote it. Our acknowledgments, Dr. Haney, whom you will meet, is our co-investigator on a lot of our research, and he is also Grassroots Health Research Director. Carol Wagner, Cedric Garland, Leo Baggerly, Michael Hollick, all of those beautiful people I, for you, celebrate. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Carol. We're going to officially thank Carol and the next speaker after the question period. So I thought we'd uh, move on to the next speaker. But before that, I have one announcement I forgot. For those interested in the uh, CCS VI and multiple, multiple sclerosis, there's going to be a conference down in Okotoks on September 30th, and they're bringing in some of the top speakers from around the world, actually. And I'm going to be going down there. And if you want to go to that conference, you can still register online. It's called Exploring Frontiers in Neurovascular Health. And you just go to the website of the National CCS VI Society. Okay, so that's an important conference for anybody with MS. However, back to vitamin D. Um, if Carol thinks she's going to get it easy, she's wrong, because I'm going to ask Carol to come up and introduce the following speaker. <laughs> See, Carol, you can just do it with this. Here comes my very, 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 very most favorite vitamin D person in the whole wide world, except for maybe my husband. Robert, where are you? There he is, Dr. Robert Haney. Um, um, Dr. Haney is an expert in vitamin D. He is an expert in medicine. He is an expert at running a medical hospital and clinic. And he has published 400 plus papers, 500, I don't know, I can't even keep track. And he's co-authored on several grassroots health papers already. And he's brilliant. He's kind, generous, brave, and true. Hurry, Robert. <laughs> well, you heard what Carol said, that people would believe after you had those kinds of introductions. And she was right. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you all for the opportunity to be here with you this evening. Um, I, I'm very impressed. Are we not getting sound? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, great. Hmm? Well, I'm just talking first. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm very impressed with the, with the enthusiasm and the passion that so many people have for this issue, um, particularly here in Calgary, where you've got the Pure North uh, Synergy Foundation, and you've got Direct MS, and, and uh, we've got Perry and the Vitamin D Society, uh, this is g very gratifying, I must say, for someone in the field uh, like myself who uh, wonders what on earth can we do to build a fire under people, as Carol uh, mentioned she tried to do at the, at the National Institutes of Health conference uh, several years ago. So uh, with, that, uh, with that introduction, I'm going to drill down into a little bit more detail for you uh, with respect to what it is we're talking about this evening. 
First of all, uh, we're going to talk about why vitamin D is important. We're going to talk about where we get it. And we're going to talk about how much do we need. Uh, why vitamin D is important? Well, because it's necessary, first of all, we've known this for 40 plus years, it's necessary uh, for the body to absorb enough calcium from our diets. Uh, it's also uh, something that functions as a part of the intimate biochemical apparatus of all of our tissues, uh, enabling them to respond to routine, ordinary, everyday stresses and signals. We have to adapt, we have to respond. Vitamin D is a part of the mechanism that helps us do that. And the consequence, therefore, is that in the absence of adequate vitamin D, none of our body systems work as well as they were designed to do. So it's not just a single function like calcium absorption. It's basically the totality of how our bodies operate. Now, <clears throat> I think we all are concerned with the problem of chronic disease. It's what fills the doctor's offices and waiting rooms. It's the breakdown of structure or function of a body system. It's what happens to our automobiles after we use them for years and abuse them sometimes. Uh, with our bodies, the origin of chronic disease is multifactorial. It's due partly to our genetic heritage and uh, as that interacts with the environment. And the environment consists of such things as nutrition, infection, various toxins, environmental toxins, and then, of course, finally, injuries of one kind or another. Now, uh, unlike our automobiles, uh, the body has a mechanism to repair this damage or to fight it off at the onset, um, and, and our cars don't. Vitamin D is an essential component of that uh, mechanism. Low vitamin D status impairs the body's ability to take care of these things that are happening to us every day. Now, one example of that uh, is um, Life expectancy, Carol showed you that improved life expectancy can, should be expected with improved health. Demographers have suggested that the average human lifespan is about 85 years, and if we didn't have other problems going wrong with us, we'd all be alive until we approach 85, and then we see this steep curve here with an average time of death at age 85, and by the time you're 95 or 100, we're all gone. Now, we can plot the inverse of that, which is, you know, being alive. We're all alive uh, uh, through those first 70 plus years, and then we kind of fall off the cliff. That's in theory. Now, in industrialized societies, such as the ones we live in, the survival curve looks more like this. And this difference between the theoretical curve and the actual curve uh, is the toll that chronic disease takes and all of the problems that are associated with it. Uh, there are lots of factors that influence uh, that gap. Um, optimal nutrition has the potential to contribute importantly to this improvement, not just vitamin D, but, but optimal nu nu but nutrition generally. And, and various health programs, such as in the United States, the National Cholesterol Education Program, and the Dietary Guidelines for Americans, make that very explicit. They simply take this for granted. If you follow these guidelines, they say, then you will live longer and you will be healthier. Now, the role of vitamin D in this reduction is what we're going to be talking about in more detail this evening. So this is kind of the context in which we'll be discussing these items. Now, a very clear instance of the kind of difference vitamin D makes is shown in this graph, which comes from uh, the Baltimore Healthy Aging Study. Uh, 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 the median uh, follow-up time in this study was six years. And what we're looking at, and I think I can show you here, what, uh, what we're looking at here on this vertical axis is the, uh, the uh, fraction of the individuals who started the study who were still alive at various time points along the uh, horizontal axis down here at the bottom. Now, oops. What you see here is the vitamin D status. The, the, the bottom quartile of vitamin D status was centered around 30, or was below 37 nanomoles per liter 
the top quartile was above 67 nanomoles per liter. I think you would all agree that even that number isn't anywhere near high enough. It's not the target that Carol spoke about, say 100 nanomoles per liter. But look at the difference in the survival, just going from 37 up to 67. With a nice stepwise, what we say in medicine, dose-related improvement. The more vitamin D, the better the survival until you get it. And we just can't go any higher in the top quartile because that's where they were in Baltimore. There just weren't enough people above that level to make it possible to see anything further. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more about vitamin D deficiency that was in my title. Uh, but the definition of a deficiency is any condition in which inadequate intake of a nutrient results in significant dysfunction or disease. I'm sure you wouldn't disagree with that, uh, but it's fairly important to be precise about some of these points. By contrast, nutrient adequacy is the situation in which further increases in intake produce no further reduction in the dysfunction or disease. That is, you reach the benefit, taking more doesn't hurt, but it doesn't help anymore. So we define nutrient adequacy as the point in which taking more doesn't, doesn't help. There's a real problem in defining where that point is, and Carol was talking about that just a few moments ago. Now, finally, I want to stress that nutrient adequacy is not itself the same thing as optimal health, because there are other issues that impact our health as well. What optimal nutrition does is ensure that you can't improve your health status any further by any further nutritional means. So it's the second point just generalized to the, uh, uh, to the totality of the health issue. Now I want to go over some basics so that we're all uh, talking about the same point. I know you've got some printouts there and uh, I've of course, modified my presentation a little bit between the time I, I submitted this and the time that I actually come up and stand on stage. Always do. I can never give a week old presentation. It's not possible. So uh, uh, I apologize if the sequence is not the same as you have on the paper there. But I think it's important that we understand what some of those basics are. Uh, you saying uh, you are my sunshine because the sun is in fact this, the natural source of vitamin D uh, for all of us, or at least it was under primitive or ancestral conditions. The rays of the sun uh, hit the skin and change a compound called 7-dehydrocholesterol into another compound called pre-vitamin D, which then naturally converts itself to vitamin D, and this is absorbed into our bloodstream from the skin into the blood. When it gets into the blood, as we see here, with vitamin D3 on the left, it circulates through the blood into the liver, and as Carol pointed out, that gets converted to a compound called 25-hydroxy-D. And that's important because that's the thing we measure in the blood. When you get a vitamin D test, this is what you get tested and measured. Uh, it, it's a, uh, it, uh, it puts vitamin D in a very unique position among all the nutrients because we, we just don't have this good an indicator for most other nutrients. I don't have something I can measure that will tell me whether you're getting enough calcium or not. But I've got something I can measure to tell whether you're getting enough vitamin D or not. And it's this compound called 25-hydroxy vitamin D. Now, Carol also pointed out that it gets converted further uh, in the kidney uh, to a compound called 125-dihydroxy vitamin D. Just been further modified a little bit. And that's what circulates in the blood as a hormone and goes to organs such as the intestine and stimulates the absorption of calcium. That's what that last unit is. That, that's the calcium binding protein over there, which is induced by vitamin D and helps you absorb calcium from your diet. I call this the canonical scheme because this is what we've known about for years. The scheme actually is much more complicated, much richer, and much more challenging than this, but this is kind of the basic level. This is what we've, we've, we've known about for some time. I also want to remind you that vitamin D exists in nature in two chemically distinct forms. One, vitamin D2, is called ergocalciferol, and it is synthesized from plant sterols. It doesn't exist naturally uh, in those plants, but the precursor is there, and uh, chemists can synthesize vitamin D2 out of it. Uh, vitamin D3 is the form that is naturally occurring in animals. I, I 
trying to get, I'm, I'm challenged here, I'm sorry, Carol. D3 is the natural form that we have. It's what we make in our skin on exposure to sunlight. And when we talk about vitamin D from now on, we're gonna be talking about vitamin D3 as the natural product. Vitamin D2 will work, it's not as potent, uh, it's not as easy to use, and sometimes it's not as easy to measure, but D3 is really what we're interested in. Now, I've already stressed that we get it from the sun, and under primitive conditions, that's probably where we got almost all of it. Right now, maybe we get 300 international units a day in the central part of the United States from the sun. Uh, that, that's because we're not outdoors very much. If we were out in midday in July in a bathing suit, we'd get 10, 15, 20,000 international units in just 15 minutes of sunlight. But of course, we're indoors. <laughs> we're sitting before a computer. We're not getting any ultraviolet at that point and we're making no vitamin D. So this figure of 300 is kind of an average over everybody, but with most people not getting enough. We get about 1,800 international units a day from food. Uh, uh, that's a new figure, we didn't know that before. If you actually measure the vitamin D content of the food, there's not much in there. But we now know that there's 25 hydroxy vitamin D in there, and that works just as well as the vitamin D if we get it into our bodies. Uh, that depends on what you feed the animals. For instance, the principal source of, or the principal utilization of 25 hydroxy D in the US is in chicken feed. Uh, and if you, well, I'm, uh, it makes for better uh, eggshells and stronger bones in the chickens. Uh, and, and we get some of it when we eat the chicken meat. And it's not been measured up till now. And so that's why I've got that figure down there because uh, uh, it's, it's one of the frontiers that we're, we'll, we'll be exploring. And then across the US, we average out about 200 international units per day. That's not very much, as you know. But a lot of people aren't taking any at all, so you're averaging in a lot of zeros with what people really are getting. Now, uh, as Carol indicated, we need a lot more than that. Uh, we probably need 4,000 to 5,000 international units per day, depending upon what blood level you're trying to maintain. Uh, and you see those numbers that I've put in those arrows total only a little more than uh, 2,000 a day, so we're way short. Now. Uh, how do we know your vitamin D status? Well, I think I've already told you that. Uh, it's assessed by measuring the concentration of 25-hydroxy D in the blood. Here's where the problem comes in. There is scientific disagreement about how high that concentration should be. The Institute of Medicine in the joint U.S.-Canadian task force looking at this topic, publishing their results uh, 18 months ago, uh, said, 50 nanomoles per liter was enough for everybody. And that's only half of what we would propose in terms of 100 nanomoles per liter. So there is scientific disagreement. And I'm not gonna go into detail about why that's so or how people can come up with such different numbers, but if you have questions, perhaps we can deal with them later. Uh, I think most of the experts who actually work with vitamin D would support a value of 100 nanomoles per liter. Carol gave you a list of all the scientists that have signed on to a figure such as that. And for certain effects, maybe as high as 80 nanomoles would be enough, or maybe as much as 125 would be required. So 100 is kind of a ballpark uh, central figure there. I wanna remind you uh, that such, such a level is not uh, abnormal. Uh, outdoor summer workers at the end of summer commonly have values of 150 to 200 nanomoles per liter. How did they get it? Sun exposure. They got it the natural way. None of them has vitamin D intoxication. N nobody is, I mean, you can get sunburn, you can get wrinkled skin from too much sun exposure, but you don't get vitamin D intoxication. So uh, we've got this natural experiment making it very clear that vitamin D is safe in the kinds of doses that we'd be talking about. How common is low level of vitamin D? Well, uh, here's a distribution of vitamin D values uh, in a group of over 1,100 postmenopausal women that we studied in our center at Creighton, published now about six years ago. Um, Latitude 41 degrees north, 
And as you see, there's a kind of a nice bell-shaped uh, distribution there with the average value being about 67 nanomoles per liter which isn't really very good, but, uh, th but these are semi-rural women. They're getting a little bit more sun exposure than the average office worker would or the average uh, city dweller living in concrete canyons such as New York City. Now, uh, uh, if you wanted to maintain a level of 80 nanomoles per liter, there you are. About 65% of that population was below 80 nanomoles. If you take the figure that uh, I, I think most scientists would prefer, that is 100 nanomoles per liter, we see that even in this relatively more healthy population, 84% of these women had values below that level. Uh, and if you take a figure of 125, which may be necessary for some of these cancer preventions, virtually the entire group of women had a value below that level. 99% were below there. So that shows where people are and how we have to move. Now, we have in the United States a survey called the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, NHANES, it's an acronym. And here are data on vitamin D levels in children from the NHANES study that was carried on in 2001, 2004. This is going on all the time, but it takes years for the data to get assembled so that we can present it. Uh, this, is a, this is in a publication that was in the journal Pediatrics three years ago. Uh, it involved uh, girls, 3,000 of them. Uh, there's a similar graph for boys, but it looks essentially the same. Now, what you see are three, uh, three ethnic groups, non-Hispanic whites here on the left, and these three bars, non-Hispanic blacks, whoops, uh, non-Hispanic blacks in the middle, and Mexican-Americans on the right. And the pinkish or salmon-colored bars are the fraction of the age group concerned that is below 15 nanograms per milliliter, or 37 and a half nanomoles per liter. The white bar extending above it is those between 37 and a half and 75 nanomoles per liter. Take a look at these black girls, for instance, black teenage girls. The first bar in each group is from age one to six. The second bar is from age seven to 12. The third bar is 13 to 21. But look at these black girls, teenage girls. 99% had values below 75 nanomoles, not what our white women had in Fremont, Nebraska, uh, whereas 99% was, if you were up to 125, you were gonna be below that. So by even conservative standards, the majority of, uh, of uh, black girls of any age will have severely depressed vitamin D status. The ones that were best off were the white teenagers uh, from seven to 12 and from 13 to 21. But even so, better than 60% of them had values below 30 nanograms or 75 nanomoles per liter. So all studies in virtually all countries irrespective of latitude, whether they're on the equator or whether they're up here at 50 plus degrees north. They all show that the majority of the world's population has inadequate vitamin D status, and it's a lifestyle affair. It's not a question of where we live. Um, if we don't get outdoors, then it doesn't matter whether the latitude is zero or 90. It's gonna be the same. What are the consequences? Well, Carol has hinted at some of these, and. Uh, we could spend a week going through each one of these, so I'm not going to do that. You can breathe a sigh of relief. But there are consequences with bone disease, with falls and fractures, high blood pressure, increased risk of cardiac disease, uh, prematurity and low birth rate in pregnancy, diabetes and metabolic syndrome, periodontal disease, decreased resistance to infection, various cancers, increased risk of multiple sclerosis, and increased risk of schizophrenia. Um, I mean, covers the entire gamut of human health and disease. As I said uh, uh, right at the outset, uh, uh, vitamin D is important for the apparatus that allows us to repair various stimuli and, and assaults and insults to our body systems. And whichever one may be the weakest one, that's the one that's gonna manifest your vitamin D deficiency. Uh, I learned for the first time just a few months ago 
uh, that vitamin D deficiency can be a cause of fatal heart failure in infants. I never heard of heart failure in infants. Of course, I'm an adult doctor, so I, I didn't see the infants, but, but it surely is an uncommon problem. But there you are, uh, and some of them did not have, have manifest bone disease, so you wouldn't pick them up in the usual way from, by looking for rickets. So vitamin D deficiency can affect every body system, and we see it here. Now there's, there's a good body of evidence for each one of these, or I wouldn't have listed them. I want to show you, uh, for example, a good study showing an effect uh, in the prevention of osteoporotic fractures. This was a randomized trial. It was published from the UK. Uh, it was a five-year prospective study. Uh, one group got vitamin D, the other got a placebo. Uh, and the ones who got vitamin D had an elevation in their 25-hydroxy-D from about 50-some-odd um, nanomoles to about 75 nanomoles. And what you see in the vertical bars is the relative risk of fracture of the spine, hip, or wrist, the typical osteoporotic sites that, that, that we think about with osteoporotic fracture. Uh, and you see that uh, of the individuals getting the active uh, agent, the vitamin D, as contrasted with the placebo, had a 33% reduction in fractures over the five-year period of the study. That's a statistically significant effect, so less, less osteoporotic fracture. Okay, that makes sense to us because calcium is important for bone and vitamin D is important for calcium. So, so what about something else? Well, here's a, here's a resistance to infection issue. Uh, this is another randomized controlled trial. 67 patients with advanced pulmonary tuberculosis. They all received the standard state-of-the-art current treatment for tuberculosis. Uh, in addition, they were randomized uh, in a double-blind fashion, placebo-controlled, to receive either 10,000 international units of vitamin D per day or, as I say, the placebo. And they used sputum conversion as the index of response to treatment. That is, if the tuberculosis bugs could no longer be found in the sputum, then that was considered that you had successfully treated the disease. Now, those receiving the standard state-of-the-art current therapy had a 67% you know, conversion rate, which means three-fourths of them were cured and the other fourth were not. But those receiving Vitamin D, in addition, had a 100% cure rate. Now, I wouldn't want you to leave here this evening <clears throat> for a moment thinking that tuberculosis is caused by vitamin D deficiency. It's not. Tuberculosis is caused by the tuberculosis bug. <laughs> but the bug has to work in an environment. And if that environment is vitamin D deprived, then it, it, it's going to have a lot easier time of it. And your physicians are going to have a lot harder time treating that tuberculosis because you don't have the vitamin D you need in order for your body to cooperate with the treatment and to throw off the bugs. Now, that's putting it in pretty simple terms, but I think I make my point there. Here's another body system entirely. This is blood pressure. This is another randomized controlled trial. It was published 11 years ago. As Carol says, where's the urgency? We've got the data for so many of these things. Why aren't we taking action on them? Uh, what happened in this case was that individuals were treated for just two months with either calcium alone or with calcium plus vitamin D. Now, it's been known for a long time that calcium supplementation will lower blood pressure a little bit. That's established. The question here was whether vitamin D would add something to that. So one group got calcium only and the other got calcium and vitamin D. And what happened? Well, the white bars here are the baseline uh, blood pressure values and the open bars are the, are the eight week or two month post-treatment values. And, and, and you see on the left were those getting calcium only. There was an improvement. And on the right, those getting calcium plus vitamin D, there was an improvement, a bigger improvement. Uh, uh, in one case, it was a nearly 6% drop, and in the other case, it was twice as good, a 13 plus percent drop. Now, these were statistically significant within group and statistically significant between groups. So here is a clear evidence 
that augmentation with calcium and vitamin D uh, improved the response to whatever treatment you were receiving for high blood pressure. Now, this gives me a pause because uh, it's important to understand that what we're talking about is helping the body deal with disorders. You all remember this slogan out of Atlanta that was widespread maybe 10, 15, 20 years ago. Well, uh, I think what we can say today is that things go better with vitamin D. <laughs> I mean that very literally. Uh, as a physician, if I'm treating a patient who has high blood pressure, it's essential that I make certain that that patient has adequate vitamin D status, or I'm not going to get the kind of response I need and want from the treatment that I'm giving under the circumstances. Things go better with vitamin D. Not that vitamin D is a magic bullet, not that vitamin D will do it by itself. Think about it as helping the body systems cope. Here's another example, cardiovascular disease. This comes from the Framingham Offspring Cohort, a group of individuals 59 years of age who were followed for uh, five plus years. During that period of time, 120 of them developed a major cardiovascular event, major. That means heart failure, cardiac death, myocardial infarction, heart attack. And what they did is look at the risk of that occurring as a function of vitamin D status. And here's what you see. They were using nanograms per milliliter, so you have to do a, do a multiplication in your head by 2.5. But above 15, which is 37 and a half nanomoles per liter, we have a reference value of one. That is, that's the base risk. If you were below that level, you had a 53% increase in risk of having one of these major heart, heart events. And if you were even lower, that is below 10, which is 25 nanomoles per liter, we'd all agree a pretty low value, 80 plus percent increase in risk of being in this category with uh, um, uh, uh, serious cardiac events. Um, uh, uh, this just uh, took the cardiologists uh, back because they had no way of relating vitamin D to anything going on in the heart. Uh, and they, like most people, were thinking of vitamin D mostly in terms of promoting calcium absorption from the diet, which is indeed one of its functions, been recognized for years, but just, just one of its functions, uh, and probably nowhere near the most important of them. Uh, here's another instance uh, talking about the resistance to infection. This was a study in 200 and some odd African-American postmenopausal women who were given vitamin D uh, in a three-year double-blind trial using a dose of 800, escalating up to 2,000 international units per day, which is not very much, but the study was done a long time ago and we didn't really know what the right dose probably ought to have been. Their basal 25D level was about 19 nanograms, which uh, translates to about 50 uh, some odd nanomoles per liter, just barely uh, at the level that the Institute of Medicine might think would be adequate, but nowhere close to the 100 nanomoles that we've been talking about this evening. Now, uh, uh, here's what happened in this trial. The placebo-treated women had uh, a very substantially uh, higher rate of uh, influenza over the three-year period of the trial than did the vitamin D-treated women. 30% of the placebo group had, a, had experienced a severe upper respiratory infection like influenza over the three-year period of the trial, and only nine women in the vitamin D treated group, a highly statistically significant difference. Breast cancer risk. Carol spoke with you about this. Here are some additional data. There are lots of studies out there. This is a case control study of nearly 1,400 cases and a matching number of controls. And we look for the odds of developing cancer. It was inversely associated, as it turns out, with vitamin D status. No surprise, hmm? uh, Here is serum vitamin D along the horizontal axis. This is expressed in nanomoles per liter, the comfortable unit now. Uh, and you see the lowest group was, was 30, and that's given a reference value of 1.0. 
And then the hazard ratio dropped as vitamin D status improved, exactly the kind of figure that Carol showed you with the point graphs a little bit ago. 89% decrease in risk for those who were above 75 nanomoles per liter. 75 is not even up to 100. But, 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 but once again, when you're dealing with a free living population out there several years ago, you just don't get enough people above 75 to push this graph farther to the right. You don't have the people out there. You don't know what their risk would have been. And as Carol said, Cedric Garland suggests that if you were to push it high enough, you might push this rate down to zero. Uh, I, I think that may be a little optimistic, but the important thing is that you decrease the risk. What the exact number is, we can argue about for years, but you decrease the risk. We see the same thing with colorectal cancer. Uh, this is in the Nurses' Health Study. It was 193 incident cases in women who had had their 25-hydroxy-D measured before the diagnosis of cancer. Uh, that's an important factor. And here's what we see. It's exactly the same diagram. As vitamin D status improves, the number of cases or the risk of developing uh, colorectal cancer drops. Uh, I could have used the same graph for all of these uh, slides, basically, just change the colors a little bit, <laughs> because they all show exactly the same pattern. Oops, going backwards, yeah. Uh, here's the study from our group that Carol showed you, and I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on it, but uh, this is a, what's called a Kaplan-Meier survival plot, and what it does just as in the Baltimore Healthy Aging Study, it shows you as the study proceeds along the horizontal axis, as you get more and more experience, of course, some people develop whatever the outcome measure is, in this case, cancer. Uh, and we've got them grouped here uh, by the placebo group on the bottom, a group that got calcium only and a group that got calcium plus vitamin D. And as you see, there is a very substantially lower risk if you were getting calcium plus vitamin D. The relative risk is 0 0.232. Flip it the other way around, that's a 77% reduction in cancer risk. And here are the figures that Carol showed you. And in this case, pay attention to the yellow numbers in parentheses in each of the columns. Because the placebo and treatment groups were of different size, it didn't pay to look at the numbers themselves, look at the percents. Uh, you see that breast cancer was 2.6% in the placebo group and 1.0% in the calcium plus D group. Uh, they didn't get a lot of D. This was an older study. It was only 1,000 international units per day. But it succeeded in raising their serum 25-hydroxy D level to close to that 100 nanomole per liter figure that Carol spoke about. Colon cancer went down from 0.7% to zero. Lung cancer from 1.1% to 0.2%, a five-fold reduction. Marrow lymphoma, these are the common cancers in postmenopausal women, by the way, that's how we've accounted for them. Went down from one and a half to 0.5%. And overall, as Carol said, 6.8% down to 2.0%, a better than one-third reduction, I mean, a better than two-thirds reduction. Now I wanna go back to look at the importance of uh, early life experiences. Uh, this is a little girl, um, a patient of Dr. Lyndon Keyes, the Medical University of South Carolina. You can see on the left uh, uh, that she's got rickets. Uh, she's got bow legs and, and she's got the typical deformities that you would see on x-ray. She was treated by her physician and her legs straightened out and she's fine. And so we feel good about that. The rickets have healed, but does she have subtle long life consequences that, uh, that follow from this early life vitamin D deficiency? And I'm sorry to say that the answer is she probably does. And I'm gonna show you the evidence for that statement right here. Uh, this is a graph obtained uh, from the experience of the government of Finland. Finland uh, has the highest diabetes rate in Europe. And so it's, it's a place that you uh, would want to study uh, vitamin D or you'd want to study diabetes and its causes. Uh, these groups of lines are the following. This is for ages one to four. The solid line is for boys. The dashed line is for girls. And across the horizontal axis, what you see is the year. So back in 1965, uh, there was a rate of about 10 per 100,000 
uh, individuals with juvenile diabetes in Finland. And that quadrupled by the mid-1990s, climbing steadily through that entire period of time. These are kids under four years of age with juvenile diabetes. Same thing was happening for those who were five to nine years of age. They started higher because, of course, they were older and had more time to develop the problem. And finally, for those 10 to 14, exactly the same pattern. <laughs> what was going on in Finland that might have explained this huge rise in the risk of juvenile diabetes? Well, it turns out that up until 1963, children in Eastern Europe and the whole Eastern Bloc nations received 300,000 international units of vitamin D every three months. 300,000. It's a huge dose. We wouldn't recommend that. And there were some mild cases of toxicity. Surprisingly few and surprisingly mild. We wouldn't recommend that. The point is they got a lot of vitamin D. Then in 1963, that was cut down to 2,000 international units per day. Uh, this was a recommendation, of course. Not everybody necessarily followed it. 2,000 international units per day. And that's the baseline value that we have here for this graph. Uh, in 1975, that was reduced to 1,000 international units per day. And in 1993, that was reduced to 400 international units per day. So it was cut by a factor of five, not because of any experience of toxicity, but because as the Finns looked around the world, they looked at the US, and that's what the US recommendation was, 400 international units per day. That was what the Canadian recommendation was. 400 international units per day. So uh, without the diabetes people being aware of what was happening in the vitamin D field years before, and without the vitamin D people being aware of what was happening in diabetes, here we see these two things going on at exactly the same time. Now, this dosage, which, as I say, represents the the common practice of giving, uh, I said 300,000, it's actually 600,000 three times a year. And that's what happened at this point, you see, in this graph. Now, uh, let's look at what happened as a result of getting 2,000 international units per day. There were four possibilities. You either got what was recommended regularly, or you got it sometimes, or you just ignored that. The mom said she didn't want it, or the doctor didn't believe in it, or something. And, the, and those who got so little that the doctors thought they might have uh, rickets on top of everything else. So, so these are the four categories. These are the four outcomes. Now what we're going to do is to look at this birth cohort, the 1963 birth cohort, and see what their situation was in 1994, 31 years later. We looked at the prevalence of type 1, that is juvenile or insulin resistant, I, uh, insulin deficiency diabetes. Now, the horizontal line there is the relative risk of 1.0. This is for people who didn't get any but were otherwise healthy. Those who got vitamin D regularly in the first year of life, 2,000 international units per day, had an 88% reduction in risk of type 1 diabetes 31 years later. That is, developing in the interim between age one and age 31. Those who got it uh, intermittently had an 80% lower risk. And those who had rickets and didn't get it at all, three, a threefold greater increase in risk. So uh, here is an instance where early life exposure to vitamin D status made a huge difference in what was happening downstream years later. <laughs> Now, Carol showed you this slide, and I want to stress what it is. The same 1963 birth cohort who got 2,000 international units of vitamin D per day in the first year of life, 31 years later, they asked them, how many of you had been pregnant? How many of you have had kids? How many of you had preeclampsia? And here's the preeclampsia figure. The odds ratio for preeclampsia for those who got uh, irregular or no vitamin D in the first year of life was set at 1.0, whereas those who got vitamin D regularly had a 51% reduction in uh, incidence of preeclampsia. So this again is another instance of a totally different body system, totally different body system. 
showing an effect of early life vitamin D exposure. We think vitamin D is important during pregnancy, but it's clear that vitamin D was important during infancy for what happens during pregnancy years later. It, it, uh, it's a very powerful in, uh, instance, I think, of this effect. It's not confined to Finland. Uh, uh, shortly thereafter, uh, these data were published from what's called the Euro Diabetes uh, Studies, seven European centers, each with different policies. Uh, it was a case control study, uh, and they looked at supplemental vitamin D in infancy and type 1 diabetes by age 15. Now, here there was no particular dose. Each country used a different amount of vitamin D. So the only question was, did they supplement with some vitamin D or not? And those who did not supplement, again, assigned an odds ratio, a relative risk of 1.0, and those who supplemented with any vitamin D uh, had a substantial reduction in risk, about a 30% reduction uh, in risk. So here's another study in another group of populations, another context, another type of approach showing exactly the same thing, that early life vitamin D supplementation made a difference in development of a serious, lifelong, massive uh, chronic disease. Uh, now, I just want to move this back to the womb. And this is where it gets, I think, interesting uh, for direct MS here. Uh, it's long been recognized uh, that the incidence of multiple sclerosis varies directly with latitude, and, and, and as uh, direct MS has pointed out, uh, Alberta has the highest MS risk rate uh, in Canada, uh, in North America, uh, for that matter. Well, it turns out that it's not just where you live, it's where you were born that is probably more important. Uh, the dividing line in the U.S. happens to be the 37th parallel, uh, or the northern border of Tennessee, a long way away from where we are right now. But if you look at the colors on this map, and I'm sorry, I don't have the Canadian figures here. These were accumulated by the U.S. Veterans Administration, and we don't have corresponding numbers for Canada. But the lowest uh, uh, rates uh, are in white on the bottom of the map, and the highest rates are in red and orange on the top of the map. And you can see there is a clear latitudinal gradient there. But the key is, uh, were you born in those states? Not where do you live now, or not where do you live when you got the MS, but where were you when you were born? Uh, and so, a couple of years later, a group together uh, got essentially all the patients with MS in Canada, the UK, Denmark, and Sweden, and combined them and looked at their birth records. Now, uh, if the uh, time of year when you were born made no difference, then you would expect that the observed rate of MS in a birth month would be the same as the expected rate. That is, whatever it was averaged over a 12-month period of time, that's what you would have. But you'll see here uh, that the odds of having MS later in life were highest for those who were born in May and lowest for those who were born in November. Uh, and uh, 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 the, uh, that's where it would be if you were, were getting the observed to be equal to the expected, or a ratio of 1.0. But there's the curve that we actually see. It's a nice sine curve, and it follows sun exposure. It lags it by about six weeks, which is what we always see. There's about a six to seven week lag between the peak of sun exposure and the peak of the biological effect. Now, what happens when you have a baby in May? Well, you carried that baby through your pregnancy through the darkness of winter. And if you have a baby in November, then most of your pregnancy was centered around the summer and fall months when your vitamin D level was highest. So this fits what we know about the annual changes in vitamin D just beautifully. The same is true uh, uh, even for adult multiple sclerosis. Um, uh, this was a study done from the Nurses Health Study. Uh, they had a better than 2 million person years of observation, and during that period of observation, there were 173 new cases of multiple sclerosis. And uh, here's what we see here in, in which 
the incidence of multiple sclerosis is plotted as a function of vitamin D intake from diet history. Now, they didn't know about 25-hydroxy D, so it's just did you eat salmon or, or whatever. Uh, uh, and there's a significant downward trend. They did the same thing for whether you were taking supplements or not that, that would have contained vitamin D, and you see exactly the same kind of a downward trend. So here, uh, uh, having low vitamin D status as an adult also predisposes you to multiple sclerosis in this database. Uh, Munger, the principal investigator here, here, has done the same thing for the U.S. Department of Defense on bank serum samples taken from soldiers during uh, uh, the Korean War, where we have frozen samples and they have long-term history through the Veterans Administration, so they have a pretty good idea of, of what the incidence rate was. You see exactly the same pattern that we see here. Here's another instance of intrauterine exposure. This was a paper that was published just uh, last year from the Netherlands. They had 156 healthy full-term Dutch infants, healthy, and they obtained cord blood at delivery. And then they, they monitored them for the first year of life to see how many of them developed RSV infections, that's respiratory syncytial virus, which is a major cause of morbidity and mortality in the first year of life. And here's what they found. Um, uh, uh, those who got the infection at some point in that first year of life had a lower cord blood level, about 65 if I read that graph correctly, whereas those who did not get the infection at any point in their first year of life started out life with a level of about 90 nanomoles per liter, substantially and significantly higher. Uh, and here, uh, if we flip it around the other way to see where the effect is most prominent, uh, you can see very clearly it's those who started life below 50 nanomoles per liter uh, had about four times higher risk of getting a, an infection from this virus uh, than uh, uh, individuals who started above that level. Now, now, this was exposure in utero because the blood was obtained at delivery from the cord. So here's another instance where vitamin D status in utero influenced what happened after the baby was born. These things that we've been talking about, the, these perinatal and early life associations, are what we call epigenetic. And this is a term which you may not have heard very much before, but it relates to the fact that our genes determine what we can do, but not necessarily what we do do. That is, some of the traits in our genes never get expressed, and that's an epigenetic effect. That is, it modifies whether the gene can express itself. And apparently what's happening here is that, uh, as well, I don't need to tell this group that an infant is not a full-grown adult. There's a lot of developing that has to go on. Well. Uh, th there's a lot of that developing is occurring in the immune system in which the body is getting programmed to recognize itself as against foreign protein. It's, it, it, uh, it's programmed to attack the foreign protein, which, is, which it does with grafts or with bacterial infections. But if it doesn't get its own auto-programming correct, then it can attack its own tissues, and that's what multiple sclerosis is. That's what type 1 diabetes is. That's what lots of the rheumatic diseases are. They're all autoimmune disorders where something has gone wrong and you haven't quite programmed your lymphocytes to recognize this as me as opposed to some other organism that I'd like to get rid of. So, so if, if that doesn't get done completely and rightly in the first year of life, then you're at risk for some of these other problems. Precisely how vitamin D does this is a wide open frontier but it's clear that that's a factor. Now, this underscores the point that Carol made. We really have to start sooner. Uh, I'm, uh, I would disagree with her when she says, you're too late, because uh, you're not. You're not. But it'd be better if we could catch everybody before they were conceived, where we can then ensure an environment with an adequate vitamin D level. It's not going to insulate them from all the other slings and arrows of fortune, but it will make sure that they're as able as possible to cope with them. So 
uh, Carol's Protect Now program uh, is a really exciting and I think a uh, very important program. Uh, I'm going to skip through a couple of these others because I think I've made my point, but uh, I do want to um, move to another neurological disease. Uh, it's been known for some time, but not very adequately publicized, that we see the same effect with Parkinson's disease. Now, Parkinson's disease is not a vitamin D deficiency disease, uh, but it's a disease, like so many others, it's made worse if you're vitamin D deficient. Uh, and that is seen here. This is uh, over 3,000 adults, age 50 to 79, who were followed for 29 years. They were healthy at the onset. 50 of them developed uh, cases of Parkinson's disease over the period of time. And here, once again, is the relative risk. The lowest quartile of vitamin D status, a sign of value of 1.0. Second quartile is about 70 some odd, uh, or 0.7. The third quartile is about 0.5. The fourth quartile is about 0.3. 70 percent reduction in risk in Parkinson's disease if you move simply to the highest quartile. How high is that quartile? Not very. It's only 54 nanomoles. What might it have been if we'd been up to 100? We don't know, because the population, when these studies were done, just isn't up there. So we don't have experience with people who are at that level. Now, I want to digress for just a moment, if I can take a moment of your time. Uh, this is an important study looking at pregnancy outcomes. Uh, these were Australian women uh, whose offspring had, uh, were tested for language skills at ages 5 and 10 in school. And the test results in school of the kids 5 and 10 years after birth were plotted against the mother's 25-hydroxy-D level during her pregnancy. So, you, so here again, you got this early 25-hydroxy-D exposure, and then you got school performance five and ten years later. Here's what we see. The, the women with the lowest maternal 25-hydroxy-D uh, quartile uh, had about 13 percent of their kids with language difficulties in school at age five, whereas those in the highest quartile had about three percent. It's a four-fold difference. I think for all of us who are parents, this is an important issue. Uh, if we look at what the uh, risks are, and I'm going to skip through this, uh, uh, what the authors concluded, and, and this is a direct quote, <clears throat> uh, and I think many of us uh, have a key on our computers, our word processors, that just hit one key and this sentence comes out. Um, randomized controlled trials of vitamin D supplementation are required to verify these observational data that suggests that an adequate maternal vitamin D status during pregnancy is necessary for optimal language development in the offspring. A randomized controlled trial. They all say that. I can't tell you how, how many papers of observational data such as we've talked about here, how many papers end up with this statement. This is interesting, but we're not going to know for sure until we do a randomized trial. Now, how would you do a randomized trial of this? Think about it. Well, I'll tell you how. You'd find a group of pregnant women with 25 hydroxy D values below 18, which was the, what the, or below 15. Uh, uh, this is nanomoles per liter. You'd supplement most of them, or you'd supplement some of them with additional vitamin D while keeping the others at their deficient level throughout pregnancy and lactation. Now, can you imagine doing that? Would that be ethical? Would it even be feasible? No, the healthy volunteer bias would mean that you would never get women who had those low levels coming into your study in the first place. And that's what's happened to study after study after study. There are some of these questions that can never be answered by a randomized trial. And yet, the official bodies are saying, we won't make a recommendation until we have randomized trial data. You'll never get randomized trial data for a study of this sort. It's not ethical. The institutional review boards, the ethics committees wouldn't permit it, even if you could talk yourself into it. 
and then thank goodness the perversity of human nature is such that it wouldn't work if you could. So uh, we just have to find a different way to approach this evidence. Now to kind of wrap things up, how much should I be taking? Well, Carol showed that no matter how much you take, some people are going to get a bigger response than others. And it's a huge difference. It spans a six-fold difference. Some people will get, say, a rise to 300 nanomoles per liter, and others will get a rise to only 50 nanomoles per liter. Same dose. So you, as she stressed quite correctly, you're not going to know whether you're getting enough unless you measure it. But if you average it out, rule of thumb, takes about 75 international units per kilo per day. That covers uh, uh, everybody from babies to morbidly obese adults. Uh, it, uh, it makes good sense. The more tissue you have, the more vitamin D you have to have in order to maintain a healthy level in the body. Most adults will need 1,000 to 3,000 international units on top of all they're getting from all other sources right now because their levels are below where we think they ought to be. And it's going to take somewhere in that neighborhood to get them up to 80 to 100 nanomoles per liter. As I've stressed, 25 hydroxy D responses vary widely. And the important thing to note is that this, it's the serum 25 D concentration that has to be optimized. The oral dose doesn't make any difference. If you don't get the dose, if you, if you don't get your blood level up to the right level, then you're not taking enough. <laughs> I mean, that's a no-brainer. The correct oral dose is the one that produces and maintains uh, the desired 25D level. Now, Carol showed you these toxicity data, and I won't belabor them further. The point being very simply that although we don't recommend that anybody take 30,000 international units per day, it's worth your knowing that there's never been a case of toxicity reported at doses below 30. And similarly, there's, <clears throat> there's never been a documented case of toxicity at blood levels below 500 nanomoles per liter. Now, we're talking about 100 to 150, so we're a long way from that. Finally, I'm through. <laughs> Serum 25D levels below 80 are not adequate for any body system. At levels as high as 125 may be closer to optimal. Levels of 150 and higher are common in outdoor summer workers. These are some some, uh, some important points to take home and think about. And inputs from all sources combined required to sustain 100 nanomoles per liter are in the range of 5,000 uh, and higher. Now that's from all sources. That includes this unrecognized food source, that includes sun, that includes whatever supplements and fortified foods you were getting right now. You're gonna need more to get up there. And finally, a point that I think both Carol and I have stressed, Early life vitamin D adequacy is vitally important for reducing the risk of autoimmune and chronic disease later in life. Thank you. Uh, the question was the association of vitamin D with vitamin C. Uh, uh, there was no vitamin C in any of our slides. There was calcium in some of our slides. Sorry, uh, I'm talking about calcium, that's yeah. right. Uh, and so your question was? How come you didn't show the slides without calcium and, ju and just show what happens with the vitamin D? Well, uh, we did not have a pure vitamin D treatment arm. We had vitamin D plus calcium, we had a calcium arm, and we had a no treatment arm. So those are the only three we had. So all I can show you. Yeah, recently, um, when I've been talking to my doctor, he tells me there are studies where uh, your calcium should always be taken in a natural form and not to take the pills anymore because the pills go in your body and the calcium just settles anyway. And that uh, the new treatments now avoid taking uh, calcium pills like that. Uh, it's always been true that the best form of calcium is the calcium that comes in food. But uh, it's not true that the pills are themselves harmful. They're just not as good as the food sources. That's been thoroughly disproved. There were some, stu some studies out of New Zealand that were widely publicized about three years ago uh, that suggested they were, these have been roundly refuted. And there are three papers in press right now that I've had a chance to see, and they show that there is no evidence at all to support that fear. But again, I do recommend getting your calcium in the form of food. But if you have to get it from pills, you can do so safely. That's that's, I think, an important message. Okay, I'll take one over here. Question over here. Uh -huh. 
Hi. Is, the, is there any research about treating uh, autoimmune disease with the vitamin D plus uh, is, and other treatments? Uh, is there any research about treating the, the, these autoimmune diseases with vitamin D? <clears throat> There's only anecdotal and observational experience. There are not controlled trials, to my knowledge. Carol, do you know of any I, uh, for type 1 diabetes, for example? I only know about various reports and observational things where they have <clears throat> demonstrated, for example, with MS, the, they have fewer lesions or fewer outbreaks once they start having a higher vitamin D. That's not exactly treatment, but it's like it's less bad. Okay. Uh, one of the problems is that it would be very difficult to get a group of people to agree to go on a placebo under the circumstances. If not you, that kind of study. It's just not that kind of a study. So it's, uh, it's an important question. It's a very hard one to answer. Okay, thank you. Uh, when you take native vitamin D, it takes a long time for the body to convert it to 25-hydroxy vitamin D. Uh, and at the large doses, such as 10,000 international units per day, it takes three to four months for it to come up to a new equilibrium level. Um, but there will be some people who won't reach that level, uh, even after three or four months. So we recommend testing every, well, no more often than once every three months, because you won't get a good picture uh, if you if you test uh, too soon, <coughs> excuse me. Okay. Yeah, some okay. I agree. Vitamin D is a, an important nutrient for uh, the body, uh, and there are thousands of uh, studies showing uh, beneficial effect. Uh, <coughs> like you have presented. On the other hand, there are almost equally numerous studies that put the effect into question. Because most of the studies that have been done are causal associations of vitamin D level versus a disease, which doesn't prove that there is a cause and effect relationship. The second thing, is, you want a question? Yeah. Question. Yeah. So, uh, because of this, the IOM has designated a study group to look into the meta-analysis of all the studies that have been made in the past, and they found them to be inconsistent and inconclusive. As a result, the current recommendation for the US is for vitamin D to be taken at the level of 600 between the age of 1 and 70, and 800 when it's beyond. I believe in Canada, we have to take more when it is the standard or the most enough sunshine. But the, the, the question is, the question is, and there are still going on randomized controlled trials, because that is the only way we can prove the effect. And so don't, don't you believe that we need to wait until the results of this before we embark on higher levels of vitamin D? That's the, the question. The simple answer is no, I do not believe that. No, and I do not believe that. And let me tell you why. Uh, uh, the IOM, the Institute of Medicine, the joint U.S.-Canadian group working on these data did find that the results of observational and randomized trials were inconsistent. That's quite true. That's true for any nutrient. That's true for vitamin C and scurvy. It's true for thiamine and beriberi. It's true for niacin and pellagra. 
on and on and on. Vitamin D is a nutrient. It's behaving like other nutrients. You'll never, ever get drug-like consistency with a nutrient because our body systems are too different. But secondly, and perhaps more importantly, there are three outcomes you can have from a randomized trial. You can have a null outcome. That is to say the difference is not statistically significantly different from zero. You can have a positive trial, which shows that the benefit is significant. <clears throat> or you can have a negative trial, showing that the agent is actually harmful. Now, if the nutrient had no relationship with a particular disease, and you, you put the hundreds of studies on some kind of a grid, you'd find they'd all be centered around the null point, because this, this is a null effect agent. It's not affecting this disease. Some would be positive, and if you'd been the investigator doing that, you'd be enthusiastic. But some would be negative, and you'd think this stuff's a poison. But most of them are null. Now, the key point which the Institute of Medicine did not point out was that almost all of the studies, 98% of them, are either null or positive. There's only one negative study that I know of, and that was done with such an abnormal dosing regimen that it shouldn't even be counted. So what we're getting is a distribution of positive and null results, but no harm. Now, under the circumstances, how would you bet if it were your own health? I mean, a betting person would say, look, this doesn't cost much. Two, it's safe. And three, it might help. Maybe it doesn't, but maybe it would. So the, <clears throat> so the prudent thing would be, Let's take some vitamin D under the circumstances. It won't hurt. This is actually for Dr. Hani. Thank you very much for your presentation, which was quite educational. If you don't mind, I do have two questions, and I think these are important questions. Question number one, what research has been done on men for <laughs> risk of falling, blood pressure, and cancer? Research that you're showing us is for women, but what about men? Well, uh, the studies that I showed from the women's health study, for example, obviously about women, but many of the other, uh, many of the other studies were from exclusively male cohorts. I didn't show you prostate cancer data. Obviously, they're all in men. <laughs> but you see exactly the same pattern as you see for breast cancer. So that's question number one. There are many other examples, but there are a lot of male studies. Question number two. Uh, some of the charts that you have shown us is for age groups 50 years and plus. <clears throat> what about less than 50 years? Uh, in terms of benefit? Well, all the diabetes studies that I showed you just now were all uh, uh, in individuals who were under 50. I mean, so there's one instance there. Um, uh, the, uh, the infections in childhood, the, the, the tuberculosis treatment, these are all in younger individuals. Uh, I think there, <clears throat> there's a tendency to concentrate on older individuals because uh, uh, there are more of them who are retired and can participate in a study. <laughs> uh, and secondly, that's where the chronic diseases begin to show up. You're not going to find very many of those at age 26. Yes, how do we go about testing our vitamin D serum? The question is, how do we go about testing our serum for vitamin D? Well, you have to get uh, a blood sample drawn and sent to a laboratory and a request made for the measurement of 25-hydroxy-D. It'll be on their lab form. You just check the box that says 25-hydroxy-D. Uh, in the United States, there are some labs that will do it just on a walk-in basis. Uh, probably in Canada, you need to get a, a physician to order the test. Uh, but you'll probably end up having to pay for it because Health Canada realized it was, it was spending too much money on measurement of 25-hydroxy-D, and so it's severely restricted 
uh, those situations in which you can get reimbursed. Mm -hmm. So that's okay. It's probably the best money you'll ever spend. How much? Well, I think I'd have to ask you for what your experience is. Okay. The labs charge you. Mm -hmm. $27 to the door here, 25. <laughs> 27. 27 is oh, worth it. I want to say something. Okay, so if I have one comment to add to that, though, that's very important to my self-interest and, and to some of yours as well. Um, if anybody wants to participate in the Grassroots Health D Action Study and get a test, um, you can log on to our website, grassrootshealth.net, and enroll in the study. And it costs $60 for the test and $5 for shipping. Anyway, it's sent to your home. It's something, it's a finger prick blood test that you can do and you fill out an online questionnaire. And we currently have about 10,000 people around the world that have chosen to do this. And the data that we gather from your participation is extremely valuable in moving this public health effort forward. So that's another option. Great. Well, a couple more questions. What's the difference between vitamin D and vitamin D3? Besides the price. <laughs> no, uh, the question is what's the difference between vitamin D and vitamin D3? Uh, uh, there is no ordinary vitamin D. It's either vitamin D2 or vitamin D3. And, and the number doesn't, it, it has no chemical significance whatsoever. Uh, it was the second vitamin to be discovered back in the 20s, so it was called D2. And the third one to be discovered was called D3 because it was the third one. The first one disappeared from the landscape, so we don't know anything about it anymore. Now, uh, th uh, this is native vitamin D. Uh, the test we're talking about, where the cost would come in, is the measurement of 25 hydroxy vitamin D in blood. Vitamin D2, you would take in a capsule or a pill. Vitamin D3, you would take in a capsule or a pill or as a food fortificant. For instance, most of the milk that's sold in Canada is uh, fortified with vitamin D3. Not to a very high level, it's a, about 100 units per glass. Uh, it's not very much, but it's a lot better than nothing. Uh, so uh, is that, I mean, I realize that can be confusing because we've got one hydroxyl group and two hydroxyl groups, but that has nothing to do with whether it's vitamin D1 or D2. Okay, we'll take one more. So, we'll go all the way back to Valentine Hill. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Ashton, I mean, I'm here to answer questions, so I'm willing to do this as long as people are willing to stay, so. so we need to give the others a chance to leave. I, I had uh, surgery on my bowel, and I'm unable to absorb my the vitamin D. Yes. I've taken it um, as a drop, as a pill. Now I'm taking it as a um, spritz under my tongue, and I'm still just my level's at 30. I'm taking 10,000 international units. I wonder if you have any other suggestions. Well, there are or two or three suggestions. One, uh, if you've had enough bowel removed, you're going to have trouble absorbing it. Uh, the sublingual absorption works in some people, but it probably, <clears throat> yeah, but you probably have to start with 50,000 unit capsules that you squeeze. Uh, <clears throat> you can get a pretty good blood level just from sun exposure or a tanning booth. I don't necessarily recommend that because that's not uh, as cost effective. Uh, probably the most effective way to do this, and I'm, I suspect it's not available in either the U.S. or Canada, is to take 25-hydroxy-D itself directly. It's more water-soluble and is more readily absorbed in people who have intestinal problems. Uh, the, only, the only organisms that get it in North America right now are chickens. It's a, it's a component of chicken feed. Uh, it used to be, well, it, I mean, it's put in the chicken feed, as I think I said a few moments ago, in order to produce better eggshells and stronger bones in the chicken. So they, you know, they've, they've got a bottom line of getting this this uh, fryer through the production line as rapidly as possible, and 25-hydroxy-D does that for them. They could have just as well have given them D itself, but because of the slow conversion to 25-D, it would have taken them too long, so it wouldn't have worked on the production line. Now, 25-hydroxy-D uh, is available in Europe, and if you can get your physician to get somebody to import some of that for you, 
then that's what I guess I would use. Uh, we used to, it used to be available in the United States and Canada, and, it, and all physicians who used it loved it, because you got, a, got, a, got an immediate response, and it was much more available to the body than is ordinary vitamin D. And I'm sorry that uh, I can't tell you anything further than that, but there is hope. Wow, okay. <laughs> what did you learn? What did you learn? Eh? Wow. I tell you, I learned, and I thought I knew everything about vitamin D. Just to tell you who I am, just quickly, I'm actually the Chief Accountability Officer of Pure North, and we have uh, 14,000 people that we're treating and uh, we have 24 doctors, we have 14 nurses, and we've been doing this uh, six, seven years, and uh, I check myself for cancer in, in many, many different ways. I take a whole bunch of vitamin D, and uh, I don't have any cancer. In fact, when they do their MRIs on all my vital organs, I look at the x-rays and it looks like I could eat them, they're so healthy. <laughs> and I'm not gonna do that, of course, but it, just trying to make a point, you know, like I hear a lot of negativity here and it always disturbs me and I hear that uh, some of the answers there are perfect, you know, he, he, these, these people are pretty darn amazing and you should really, really listen to them. I measure, 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 there's some prick tests that are coming out, you can mention Carol can do that, you can do that right away, they're getting better and better with those, it's a good thing for kids. You know, I have a couple grandkids, seven, seven years old. I actually have 11 grandkids, okay? Started young. And the seven-year-old, I didn't quite know enough about vitamin D, and I didn't, what, didn't tell uh, the mother, you know, you really need to take a lot of vitamin D. And uh, she developed a lot slower. She didn't really speak quite well. I mean, she's caught up now that she's on the D, so it's never too late. But the four-year-old, she was talking, and at nine months old, she was walking, and at and at about 12, 14 months old, she was really talking and she could almost do full sentences where the other one was probably a year or two behind. It's just darn amazing, darn amazing. I was born in 1945 and uh, every year it seems that I get my D level up. I'm about 157 right now. I got it up to 200 once and that was extremely hard. I'm really a firm believer that those curves, you get up in the 150, 200 range maybe a little bit lower, you're not gonna get cancer. You're not gonna get it. I have no sign of cancer. We have many methods in Pure North of early detection of cancer that we use all the time on people just to make sure no cancer showing up, no cancer. So just throw that out at you, all the naysayers that I heard a little bit out there. That's just my personal experience. And so I learned a few things about uh, barbaric uh, treatment that Carol got. <laughs> And I'm really sorry, Carol, you know. My parents got barbaric treatment. My dad died of cancer. My mother could have died of cancer. She's just a little bit older than I am. She's 84 years old, and uh, she looks like my sister. Because I got her on vitamin D early enough. I didn't get my dad on vitamin D early enough, but I got her on D enough. And uh, she's gonna maybe outlove me, but I'm trying pretty hard. And, you know, start sooner. Talk about the pregnancies and, and doing it in pre-pregnancies. We have many, many nurses that they're constantly getting pre pregnant at Canadian Nat or Pure North. And you know what? <laughs> their D levels are high. Their D levels are high. They're, they're in the 150 plus range. And these kids, they're gonna be smart and healthy. You should see these women. I mean, they're just beautiful looking. And you know, it's all a lot to do with the vitamin D. Of course their genes help a little bit, but you know, I can't say enough that, that low D, from what I see in the seven years that we were impounding vitamin D into us, pretty much is going to get you in a whole bunch of trouble if you're going to be low D. And I can see that with all the people that we're treating, and you know, we're treating 14,000 people now, and we add about five, 600 a month because people come to us in droves to uh, get these high amounts of vitamin D and get some confidence and feel good and feel better, which is our motto. You know, I see some of those Finnish kids. I really feel sorry for those kids that at a young age, uh, they didn't get enough vitamin D and then look what happens to them. And there's some other studies in Finland where, you know, that some of the people were saying that these people would get pancreatic cancer. Well, the, these studies have been disproven many, many times by people at Harvard and other places. You're not gonna get cancer. You're not gonna get prostate cancer. 
You're not going to get any kind of cancer if you get your vitamin D level up. And so enough said, somebody said it wasn't a magic bullet, and somebody said that these people didn't really think themselves that they were magic. Well, I think that they are magic, and I really think that, uh, that vitamin D is a magic bullet, and I really think we should give them a big hand for, for what they told us tonight.